How should elders in the church be chosen? Well, this tough task can be one of the most divisive issues in our churches today, but does it have to be? Does God's Word give us criteria to help us choose these leaders? Well, I think you know the answer, and welcome to Through the Bible, because in a minute, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, is going to take us through the Apostle Paul's answer to these questions, and he shares wisdom about church leadership from his many years in the pastorate as we dive headfirst into 1 Timothy chapter 3. So grab your Bibles and get ready to study, and welcome my friend and Through the Bible's president, Greg Harris. So hi, Greg. We're glad that you're here. Well, thanks, Steve. I'm glad to be here. And leading a church body and even a Christian ministry like Through the Bible certainly has its challenges, doesn't it? Oh my goodness, yes. I I will tell people when friends or colleagues, when I meet with them, I no two weeks are the same for me, and I love that. I, I don't like to be bored. But boy, we have a lot of challenges, and you know, you and I are getting to be a little bit older, and uh, we've we've passed a few age milestones, yeah. and we we have seen a lot of change in our life, haven't yep. we? Technologically, we have. we have. And the thing that keeps us grounded and not going off track, I think, is the commitment that that we've had, and you've done a very good job reiterating and driving home to everyone our core values. Mm, thank you. And we've got a we got a whole bunch of them, and let's focus on a couple of those today. Yeah, and and one of our core values is to offer as many different ways as possible to listen to the whole word taught so that you can find your best way. And I have come up with a shorthand way of saying we're media agnostic. We we just want the best, most cost-effective way to offer the word of God to fling the seed. And one of the ways that we've addressed that in the in the last few years, and you are as chairman of the board have supported, and our board of directors has supported a major initiative into new technologies. Mm-hmm. And one of the expressions of that is we have started to build uh, dozens of brand new apps, and the apps are quite simple. We're, we call them through the Bible, Bible apps. And so it is a an app with a Bible in one language, and then it has the, the systematic teaching in that single language. Yeah. Some people in, in uh, products would call that white label. We simply yeah. don't put our name on it, but we put the Bible on it, and then we put it in all these different app stores, and people get the Bible because they're searching for it, and then they get the Bible teaching along with it. Exactly. And our premise is this, that I hate to break it to all of us, but more people are interested in the Bible than the ministry of through the Bible. Yes. And, and we're okay with that, by the yeah. way. We, we're very, we're fine with that. And so what we've seen, we have launched as of this recording, uh, 49 different language Bible apps. Mm. And Steve, we've just put them out there. Uh, it's like putting your, your bait in the water in the ocean. There are yeah. millions of apps out there. Yeah. And guess what? Those 49 apps have had downloads in 190 countries. But what gets really interesting is when you look at it, say, an individual language. App. Yeah, and the fact you would think, oh, this particular language, let's let's say Lugandan, one of our earlier yeah, ones. Yeah. Oh, that's a Ugandan language. So we're going to see all of the downloads happen in Uganda and maybe a, a few other countries. Yeah, surrounding yeah. countries, yeah. sure. But oh no, my friend, yeah. they are all over the world because yeah. guess what? Ugandans live all over the they world. They do, and, and they want to listen to Bible teaching in their native tongue. And I think uh, my memory serves me correct. It's that app has been downloaded in. 50 different countries. But one of the biggest surprises for me as I go through the analytics and look at everything that's that God is doing is the Greek app. Again, mm. what what would you think? You know, maybe a few dozen countries. Yeah. 111 countries have wow. downloaded that app. Wow. And here's the other thing we're finding that the the amount of Bible consumption is almost very consistently, 10 times the amount of studies listened. Now, some of our people yeah. are like, aren't you promoting Dr. McGee? And we will. There there are these technological ways that you can interact with the listeners. But this is proving the concept that more people want the Bible, and then we will slowly introduce them yeah. to Dr. McGee. Yeah, it is so exciting. Yeah. And the other thing about our core value that I like is that we're choosing to work in partnership with people that are already on the ground in those ministries. So it's not like yes. we're sitting somewhere in Silicon Valley dispatching these apps That's all over right. the world. There's still yeah. the philosophy of through the Bible of following up, of discipling, of getting people connected with local churches. All of that is still happening in the local level because of the partnerships that 
we're committed to maintaining. Yeah, technology, when it's used properly, always accelerates and uh, multiplies at, a, at an exponential level what human beings can do. And so we use the power of technology to get to more people and then drive those people to the actual human networks yeah. that we have. So yeah. we don't want to be too technical or strategic, but we hope the heart of this is we want more people around the world to get the word of God. Amen to that. Let me pray as we begin our program. Heavenly Father, we pray that that would be the case, that more people would come to know you in part through the ministry of Through the Bible and these apps that are out in all those different app stores. And we pray that those people would get plugged into local churches and that they would be discipled by godly, godly elders in those churches. Be with us now, Lord, as we study 1 Timothy chapter 3. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're headed off to 1 Timothy chapter 3 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we come today to the third chapter of 1 Timothy, and we have now come to a new section here, the officers in the churches. And this is, of course, very practical, has to do with the local church. And he says here, and I'm reading now, verse 1, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, the word bishop here is a word that has been misinterpreted, and it also has been interpreted differently by different groups. Those that believe in an Episcopal form of government in the church, they put the emphasis here upon this word. And the word bishop actually means an overseer or a superintendent. And there is another word for this office. In the early church, the pastor was called by different titles. He was called a presbyter or elder. He was called a pastor or a shepherd. And he was called a bishop or an overseer. And the word minister was used of him, of course, also. And he was never called reverend, and I do not think any preacher ought to be called reverend. And reverend means terrible, by the way, and that may be applicable to some of us, but it means that which incites terror, and it's a name that only applies to God. But these are different words that are used. Now, I believe personally that elder and bishop are the same person. As I say, the Episcopal Church would disagree with that altogether, or every church that has that form of government. I believe that the elder, which is the Greek presbyteros, is the word applied to the person. That is, he must be a mature Christian, and we'll see that that was important. And then bishop, and that's the Greek episkopos, that applied to the office. Now, you have here the word elder, and also the word bishop. And I think that they apply actually to the same individual. But regardless, a bishop never in the early church had an authority over other bishops or other elders. And he did not have an authority over churches. You do not find that in the Word of God. Even Paul, who founded churches, never spoke of himself as the bishop of a church are the one that was ruling the church in any way whatsoever. And therefore, we find that the minister, as we call him today, of the church, and that's certainly a misnomer because a minister applies to every member of the church. We're all ministers. That is, we all serve, and that is, of course, very important. Now, we are given certain positive qualifications and then negative qualifications and here we are given, in verse 2, the positive qualifications. But before I get into that, let me make a change it to, and actually this first verse here, it says, this is a true saying. That's better, I think, translated a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. This is a saying that stands the test of time, one you can depend on. And if a man desire, and I do not like that word either, I think a better word, seeks. If a man seeks the office of a bishop, and the word has in it the thought of the activity of his seeking the office. And I believe that a man that has the qualifications 
ought to seek the office. In other words, he ought to want a place where he can use the gift that the Spirit of God has given him. And if the Spirit of God has not given him the gift, and the Spirit of God is not leading him, then it would be a tragedy indeed if the man sought the office of a bishop. Evidently, there were not just one in a church to begin with. There were several in a church. Now he desireth a good work. This is a place where he can serve in the church. Now let's look at the positive requirements. A bishop then must be blameless. Now, that word blameless here can, I think, be misunderstood. You're going to be blamed. If you take any office in a church, you're going to find out that you're going to be blamed. I was a pastor too long not to know that. But the important thing is the word has in it the idea that when the accusation is made that it'll not be true. That is the thing that is important, that you'll be blameless in the sense that what you're accused of, that you're not guilty. And probably the best word would be not guilty. A man that's not guilty, and that is living a life of the things he'll be accused of. And that reminds me of my experience when I first went to downtown Los Angeles as a pastor, and I met Dr. James McGinley, in Chicago, I guess the first few months after I'd been called there and was pastor, he said to me, how do you like being pastor of that great church? Well, I said, it's a marvelous opportunity, but I find myself in a very unique place. I'm accused of many things, and I can't defend myself. You can't spend all your time uh, uh, answering everybody, so I've determine that the thing I do is just preach the Word of God and not try to answer them because I can't answer them. And he said, isn't it nice that you're accused of something and you're not guilty? It's nice to be in that position, and that's what a bishop should be. He's blameless. He'll be accused of something, but he won't be guilty. Now, it says he should be the husband of one wife. Now, that can be taken in two different ways. The husband of one wife could mean that he ought to be married. And I'm of the opinion that that is probably the thought that's in the mind of Paul. But somebody's going to say he was not married. Well, those of you who have been with us through 1 Corinthians know that I take the position Paul had been married. I think Paul had had a wonderful wife, and she'd probably died, and he never married again because he's out as an apostle now. But... I believe that he was married. He couldn't have been a Pharisee and not been married. And I think that that is true there. I remember when I first became a pastor, ordained, a friend of mine, he belonged to another church, and he was constantly, and he was doing more than kidding me. He thought I was entirely wrong. He says, you have no right to be a pastor if you're not married. And he gave me this verse, you should be the husband of one wife. But I think primarily the meaning is he shouldn't have two wives, the husband of one wife, because in that day, polygamy was a common thing. Bigamy was certainly prevalent, but a Christian should be the husband of one wife. And then the next word, he should be temperate. The word in our translation is vigilant. I like a better word than that. I like the idea of he should be cool and calm and not credulous. In other words, he should be a man who knows how to keep his cool. And then the next word here is he should be sober, and probably sober-minded is a better word, and even still a better word is he's serious. He means business. That doesn't mean he shouldn't have a sense of humor, but he's serious about the office that he holds, and of good behavior. Now, I think the better word there is orderly. He's orderly in his conduct. He doesn't do questionable things. Uh, I know a minister that got himself in a great deal of difficulty here in Southern California. He came and talked with me, and I'm confident the man was not guilty of what he was charged of. They said that he had an affair with a certain woman in the congregation. 
I'm confident from the information that came to me from several sources, he was not guilty, but he was certainly careless in his conduct. They'd be out in a social group. He was a young minister, and he was here when I first came to California, and I was a young minister then, and I've been out with him, and I know that he does many careless things. And in his own church, they would be having a social gathering, and he would kid, and he would say to another man's wife, well, I'm going to take her home tonight. And he would take her home, and that fellow would take his wife, and then he'd leave her at the door, and then he'd go to his own home. And they did that with a great deal of kidding. May I say to you, that can arch eyebrows, and that can cause a great many people, especially the gossips, to start talking. My feeling is that an officer and a minister, his conduct should be above reproach. Oh, kidding is fine, but don't let it lead to questionable things. And that is the thought that I'm sure that Paul had here. And he should be, now he says here, of good behavior. And that is the word that we're after, orderly. And he's given to hospitality. And that means that he's a hospitable individual. That means that he's the type fellow that invites his preacher to lunch. You know, that type of a fellow, hospitable. I like fellows like that always have. I'm kidding now. And there are a lot of wonderful men of God like that around that really are, are hospitable. And I have the privilege now of doing something I never was able to do before, travel all over the country, and I meet so many wonderful laymen today. And many of these laymen, they just come and put their arm around me and say, now, can I help you some ways? Anything I can do for you? I go to certain places, and I go to the room and there's a bowl of fruit there and there's a bouquet of flowers there. And I find out some very fine elder and his wife put that there. And then I go down here to San Diego and a tooth of mine that was kept broke off and I needed a dentist. And a doctor friend of mine, they introduced me to a dentist. And you know, I go all the way to San Diego now because he's such a wonderful fella. Just one of these hospitable man. He's a deacon in the church down there. May I say all across the land today, these wonderful people like this. Now let me read on, apt to teach. And I'd emphasize that I do not think any man ought to be an elder in a church or a bishop in a church unless he can teach the Word of God. Now I used to say to my officers, and some of them didn't appreciate it, and the reason they didn't appreciate it, because they couldn't qualify. I used to say that I wish that it were possible for me to give a theological test to every officer. And if he didn't pass it, he wouldn't be an officer. And I still say that would be a mighty good idea. I never put it in, but you know, we retired preachers, we got all the answers today. We tried to tell everybody else how to do it. We didn't do it, but we're telling everybody else how to do it, but I do think that would be a good thing. Now we come to the negative qualification here in verse 3, not given to wine, and I'm sure that's understood. Surely should not be a drunkard and not violent, that is, no striker, or let me give you my word, not pugnacious. And then the next is not greedy of filthy lucre, and that means that he shouldn't have a love of money, the Love of money, we're told, is the root of all evil. And he should not have that love of money. And that's led many an officer into trouble. The way they handle their own money, the way they handle their business that they run, or where they work, and the way they handle the church money. And I want to tell you, some need to be looked into. And this is nothing idle that Paul is putting here. And he should be patient and patient means reasonable. I think that's a better word for it. You should be a reasonable man. There's some people not reasonable. You can't talk with them. You can't reason with them. Others you can, and not a brawler. Now, that means he's not contentious. Now, some men are constantly stirring up trouble in the church. They ought never to be made an officer and not covetous. Now, again, you say this is money lover, but this is a form of idolatry. It's not only the love of money, but it's actually the worship of it, putting it ahead 
of everything. And now we go on one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity in his own home. An elder should be the authority without being a dictator. And he wouldn't know how to rule the house of God if he can't rule his own. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, that's 1 Timothy 3, 5. Now, not a novice, and this is very important. This is something that we need to emphasize. Not a novice here means actually not a recent convert, one that is just not a new convert. Sometimes a man's converted one week, and the next week they make him an officer or have him up giving a testimony, and I don't think he's ready for it. One of my criticisms out here, and I'll get letters on this, but I don't mind that because I declare what I believe to be the truth. I had the privilege of teaching the Hollywood Christian group for several years, over a several-year period, and I came to know many of these folk. And if there's one criticism that I have, since they are prominent, they naturally push to the front. And some of them think they've become theologians. And I think that the cause of Christ has been hurt by the Hollywood crowd who attempted to become authorities in things that are Christian. I think it's fine if they want to give a testimony. But when they begin to tell you, some of the old saints who've been Christians for years, about this doctrine and that doctrine and another, I say they've hurt the cause of Christ. As I say, I'll get letters on that, but that's all right. We want letters. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Now, that was the devil's great sin, was pride. That's the great sin of officers in the church. And it can be of preachers also. And it can be in any field, for that matter, but especially in the church. It's very reprehensible when it is there. Now, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are on the outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. In other words, if a man has a bad reputation outside, for instance, he doesn't pay his bills, or you can't trust him, or he's a liar, that man immediately is a candidate, not for an officer in the church, but a candidate of the devil. And he'll better represent the devil than he will the cause of Christ. Now, verse 8, we come to the deacons now. And here are the requirements of deacons. And we are told here, in like manner, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not two-faced. And that can be a dangerous thing. A man that tries to please everybody or doesn't have the courage to stand his own. There is a fine balance between a Mr. Milktoast and a dictator, but an officer in the church ought to be somewhere between those two. And he should not be given to much wine, or not greedy or filthy lucre. And again, I'm not going to enlarge on that because I take it just like it is. I believe the Bible teaches temperance, and I think that's the important thing. I do not think the Bible teaches total abstinence, because you must remember there weren't many medicines back in those days, and wine was a medicine, and it can be a medicine if it's used that way. And after all, isn't about 50% of the medicines that you and I take today, isn't the base of them alcohol? In fact, they found out a woman that was head of one of these temperance movements, she died, and she died of sclerosis of the liver. And they couldn't believe it because it had been caused by alcohol. And they found out that she had taken a tonic for years that was 70% alcohol. I'm telling you, she was teaching total abstinence, but she sure wasn't following it. She was really taking a medicine that she said helped her. It was 70%. So alcohol can be used in a way that's medicinal. But I think when it's used in the way of being a beverage, that's when the problem arises. It should be a medicine. And Paul's going to say that to a young preacher here to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. And that was because Timothy probably had a little trouble with his tummy. I guess as a young pastor, he had trouble with a bunch of deacons. That'll give you an ulcer quicker than anything. 
Now, I'm going to leave off right at that particular point today, and I'll pick right up there next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Join me this weekend for Dr. McGee's powerful Sunday sermon, Remember Jesus Christ. You can listen on our app, online at ttb.org, or to see if your station carries a Sunday sermon. You can always call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Again, to be in touch with us, 1-800-65-BIBLE is the number, or visit ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, joining with the team at Through the Bible and saying how glad we are for your company on the Bible bus. God bless you today as you walk with Him in His Word. Our journey on the Bible bus today is supported by the prayers and gifts of fellow passengers as we travel through the Bible.